so good to be with all of you today on this uh, seventh Sunday after Pentecost. I want to uh, welcome our live stream audience as well. I know that's a blessing to so many people who were who were shut in and uh, uh, convalescing like I was. So uh, I want to welcome you as well as those who are watching from a distance. At the 8 o'clock service this morning, um, we had a sending for 19 uh, confirmation age students from Bethlehem, 19, uh, going up to Camp Linhaven for a week of what we call camp formation. Uh, their confirmation, confirmation age uh, students uh, going into seventh grade, so there's some sixth graders, seventh graders, eighth graders, and actually a couple uh, who have participated in this event in the past and uh, wanted to go again. So Pastor Nate is not here today because he is the pastor leader uh, for the 19 young people from Bethlehem. But it's not just Bethlehem that participates in this week of camp formation at Camp Lynn Haven in North Carolina. Uh, there are several other churches that participate as, as well. And I, if, if I remember the number correctly from Pastor Nate, it's about uh, 100 uh, or so students that participate in this week of camp formation. So uh, today, uh, in the special prayers, we'll pray for uh, the students, that uh, this is a blessing to them, that they grow in their relationship with one another, uh, they grow in their relationship with, uh, with Christ, and uh, we'll also be praying that they have safe travel and that they, they come back to us uh, safely, uh, because they are the future of the church. They're the church of today by virtue of their baptism. Uh, but they are also the future of the church. When I'm not here in 25 years or so, they uh, are going to be the church sitting where you are, and perhaps even some of them uh, standing, uh, some of them might be pastors or teachers in our, our church as well. So we pray God, God's blessing on their week. Uh, next Sunday, July 14th, uh, the Holy Land Ministry uh, will be here. This is not another mission that we are adopting. There's not going to be a door offering, uh, but in the the Holy Land Ministry goes to support the Christians in, uh, well, the church that gave birth to all of us in Jerusalem. And at the turn of the century, just 24 years ago, there were about 30% of Jerusalem was Christian. And today it's less than 1%. And in part that's because of the, uh, the wars, uh, the conflicts that they've been having, tourism, the pilgrimages are, are uh, declining. And so... Uh, many of the Christians made their living off of the, uh, uh, the tourism trade. Well, now they're not there, and they've really been struggling, and their churches are struggling. So uh, we're not going to them, but they're coming here. And uh, next week they'll be set up in the courtyard, and uh, they're going to bring their olive wood crosses, nativity scenes, ornaments, and things like that, and that's one way that we can support their, their ministry. Um, Katie Groon, Katie Groon Satterfield, is also uh, supporting a, a mission that's called Isaiah House. And Isaiah House supports the emotional, physical, and spiritual needs of children who are awaiting placement in a foster care family or an adoptive family. So she's going to be uh, selling uh, lemonade at her lemonade stand next Sunday. At the same time, the Holy Land ministry is going on, so I think it works really well. You go and you buy a glass of lemonade, and then you go over and you talk to the Christians from, uh, from Jerusalem, and if so, that can uh, buy one of their uh, olive wood crafts as well. I think it'll be a, a wonderful Sunday. Uh, men's Bible study, not this Thursday, but the following Thursday, the 18th, starts at 6 o'clock, starts with a meal. Um, and then there's about an hour of Bible study. It's really just a wonderful fellowship of men. So guys, if, uh, if you're going, I want to encourage you to keep going. If you're not, I'd like to encourage you to give it a try. That'll be on Thursday, uh, the 18th of this month. And then the women's retreat, August 23rd through the 25th at Luther Springs. And you can sign up now on Sign Up Genius. Do you have anything, Pastor, or Vicar? He, we've been together for almost a year. You know, after today, he only has two weeks left. So uh, we're really going to miss him. He's kind of a pastor. Yes, Rhoda. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you for that, 
wrote a, if you didn't hear it, uh, if you go to Sign Up Genius for the women's retreat, she said a Google ad popped up and it even requested credit card information. It, you, you don't have to pay anything by, by credit card. Don't follow the Google rabbit hole. Uh, just, just sign up for the retreat. Yeah, and yeah, call Rhoda Newton if there are any, uh, any issues and you'd like to go. Thank you for that very much.
Spirit. Amen. We would kneel as we are able for our confession. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the name and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Having heard those beautiful and powerful words of forgiveness, please stand as we sing, Thine Forever, God of Love. <laughs> man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast, 
But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses, though if I should, though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. <clears throat> the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown, and among his relatives, and in his own household. And he could do no mighty works there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. And he charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us now join together and confess our holy Christian faith to one another and with Christians throughout the world in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> Thank you. 
grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and their helper, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Rejection is not easy to live through. In fact, there's many different ways that we all experience rejection. Some big and some small. For instance, someone might reject an idea that you have or have presented, brought up. Or maybe you ask someone out on a date and they say no. Or you apply to a job and they never get back with you. Or you apply to your dream school and you don't get in. You get a rejection letter. Rejection often makes us feel as if we're unwanted or unseen, unheard. And it brings up a whole range of emotions that we have to deal with. Anger, resentment, disappointment, despair, sadness, rage, even apathy. So how do you act when you experience rejection? I know my own typical response of dealing with rejection is to pretend and play it off cool. Lying to myself and to others that it's not a big deal. That I don't really care. So then I'll say things like, I didn't really want to make that team in the first place. Or it's, it's no big deal. I don't really care. Other people respond by withdrawing themselves and not putting themselves out there for fear of being rejected again. So they'll keep themselves hidden inside because they don't want to be rejected and they think that if they don't even try in the first place, then there's no possible way someone could ever reject them. Or sometimes people go the complete opposite end of that and they'll be super in your face about the rejection that they've experienced. They'll complain about it to other people on social media. They'll get others to rally around them and be upset with them. As a rather silly example of this, consider a person named Billy who wanted a nice job. So he got himself all ready for the interview put his favorite red shirt on and went to the interview. And then after the interview's over, he finds out he didn't end up getting the job. But he finds out that this other person did who was, happened to be wearing a blue shirt on that day. Because of the rejection of not getting the job, Billy is angry as one of the emotions he's dealing with and in his anger, he equates not getting the job to the people hiring must not have liked his red shirt he was wearing. So then Billy goes around telling everyone and complaining that he didn't get the job on account of this red shirt he was wearing. And he gets everyone else riled up and angry with him. Well, in today's gospel reading from St. Mark, we're looking at the account of Jesus being rejected by his own people in his hometown of Nazareth where he grew up. You can recall last week, Pastor Dana, in his message to us, shared how Jesus had just healed the widow who was bleeding and also raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. Well, directly after those instances, Jesus finds himself with his disciples in his hometown. And the first thing he does while he's home is he goes to the synagogue and he teaches. He shares his word with the people of the place that he was from, that he grew up. A lot of the people he likely knew well. But his teaching there greatly offended the people there, the residents of Nazareth. So much so that they essentially run him out of town and ask him to leave. So Jesus didn't stay long here, but he healed a few of the sick while he was there. 
And then we're told that Jesus went about the other villages in the surrounding area teaching. For whatever reason, the people of Nazareth didn't want to listen to Jesus, so they rejected him. It seems likely that they probably felt he was trying to make himself better than they were and telling them how bad they were in comparison when they didn't see anything of worth when they looked at Jesus to begin with. So they say, who are you that you can come here and tell us these things? Isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't this a carpenter? But what did Jesus do during that rejection in the midst of it? Well, I can imagine first it would be very difficult for him to deal with it in the sense of just imagine you going home to people you would know well and then they basically tell you to leave. They don't want you there. Imagine being hated by your own family, by the people you grew up with. That'd be very difficult. But Jesus, we don't see him just brushing off the issue and saying, well, I didn't really want to teach them anyway, so good riddance to them. I'm going to go and do my own thing elsewhere. We don't see him retreating and cutting himself off and saying, I'm never going to teach or heal again because I'm too afraid of dealing with rejection. Nor does he go and rile up all the crowds and tell them about how horrible Nazareth is because they're unwilling to listen and they're stubborn. Instead, what we see Jesus doing is Despite our typical responses of rejection, how we normally act, he takes a different approach. St. Mark tells us he calls the twelve and then began, begins to send them out two by two. And he gave them authority over the unclean spirits. So it's almost as if Jesus was saying, okay, if you're going to reject me, I'm not just going to leave it at that. Instead, I'll send my 12 out to you, and I'll have them teach and proclaim my words. 12 more to heal and to cast out demons. Despite the world's rejections, Jesus provides grace for his people. And in this moment in Mark's gospel account, where Jesus is rejected. This isn't the only moment that we see where Jesus is rejected. There's many, many other instances. As one instance, you can just think back to the very beginning of the world with the rebellion and the fall of the first man and woman, where they rejected God's command to them and his good order. And that rejection was met with the first gospel promise. The promise that Jesus would one day be born and that he would bruise Satan's head, that Satan would bruise his heel, which was a promise that death would be defeated forever. You can fast forward from there and tons more rebellion and rejection is happening. So much so that there's hardly anyone righteous found in the world at all. So God sends a flood to cleanse the earth. But he saves Noah and his family. And later God gives grace through that act by giving a promise of the rainbow which shows that he would never again act in such a way that nothing like that magnitude of flooding the entire earth would ever happen again. You can fast forward from there where Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers. And God uses that moment to bring grace to save countless people in the surrounding area of Egypt through a severe famine. It was through Joseph's acts that all those people were able to be saved. And eventually... The Egyptians reject the Hebrews and their God. And they start to enslave them and kill them. Which then God sends grace through Moses. And the exodus out of Egypt. 
eventually bringing his people to the land he promised them through Abraham. And then when they get to the promised land, the Israelites get caught up in a really hefty cycle we like to call the cycle of the judges, which has four parts. The first part consists of Israel rejecting God and his commands and instead going to these other gods of neighboring countries and worshiping them, bowing down to them. And God disciplining his people in some way, often by allowing these other nations to come in and conquer the Israelites. And Israel, after being conquered, they repent of their rejection and rebellion and they turn away from their idols and then God sends them a judge or deliverer to deliver them from this discipline, to deliver them from this nation that was conquering them. And this goes on and on and on, repeating itself for a period of 400 years with 12 different judges that God sends his people. You can think people like Samson or Deborah or Gideon, just to name a few of the judges that God sent his people. Though the Israelites continued to reject God and his commands continued over and over and over again through this cycle to go to these other gods, God met, with, met them with grace by sending them judges, continuing to save his people. And then fast forward a bit more, and Israel, Israel is begging God for a king. And upon having kings, more and more rejection and rebellion takes place by God's people. But instead of judges, this time God sends prophets, like Ezekiel from today's Old Testament reading. He sends prophets and messengers to send his word of redemption and to elicit a response of forgiveness and of his people. But as Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town and among his relatives and in his own household. So eventually these prophets that God sent his people to bring them to repentance were rejected just the same as God's word was. You can think of Elijah not wanting to return to Israel because of King Ahab who wanted to kill him. And yet God was gracious and still despite all the rejection over centuries and centuries and centuries that his people showed him. He sent prophets and messengers and judges. But those prophets and messengers and judges were not the climax of God's grace despite saving his people. There was more yet to come from God. And that was when he sent his one and only son to his people. The son he promised them from the very beginning. So Jesus is not a stranger to rejection whatsoever. His own, his own people rejecting him while he's in the midst of them isn't the first time he has been rejected and it certainly isn't the last. And ultimately, despite their rejection, what Jesus does in response is he dies for them. He walks down the road to the cross of Calvary for them. Every drop of blood that was spilt was for them. Every pain-riddled second spent was for them. It was all for a people who rejected him, who refused to listen. Jesus rose for them. Not only that, but Jesus died for you. Do you yourself not reject Jesus with every angry thought that flows in your mind? Do you yourself not reject Jesus when you ignore the helpless or when you put yourself above everyone else? Do you not reject Jesus when you find your identity in other things besides the very one who made you and created you? 
friends, the reality is we reject Jesus every day of our lives. And for that, we are the ones who deserve a gruesome death on the cross. But the fact remains that we have a God who deals out grace in the midst and in the face of rejection. We have a God who says, I know exactly who you are. I know exactly what you have done. I want you. And I love you. I died for you. Come home. Even as we were enemies of God, dead and lost, Jesus chose you. He died for you. Jesus gives you his spirit through his word. He gives you himself, his body and blood through the holy sacrament of the Lord's Supper. He gives these things to you so that you wouldn't live in rejection, but you would live in grace. So how do we act in the midst of rejection when we try to share the gospel with others? Well, there are two options that I see pretty regularly. The first option is in the face of social rejection, the church either doubles down in fear of the changing world and hides within itself and retreats within itself, hiding in its own little bubble. Or the church goes the other way and gives in to society's rejection. It embraces what the world says and rejects the part of the church that they don't agree with. Now, of course, both of these options are wrong. It's wrong for us to hide behind these walls and completely disengage from the world outside of our bubble. I'm reminded of the Apostle Paul who, through his own experiences and travels, understood exactly what the world was like for non-Christians. And because of that, he was able to talk and take the statue of the unknown God and be able to turn that into a teaching moment. Instead of saying, you shouldn't be worshiping this God. Instead he says, let me tell you who this God really is. That'd be kind of like us today taking a show or a movie or a book or a song and showing others how that relates to Jesus. One of the professors at the seminary in St. Louis actually does this with films. He has a group that's called the Christ in Film Group. And what he does is he'll pick a movie and then he'll invite people to come and watch it and after the movie's over, he'll spend a great deal of time talking about the different ways that the movie points to Christ in it. And a lot of these movies are movies you would never expect to have Christ in them. Movies like The Big Lebowski or The Cowboys with John Wayne or The Count of Monte Cristo, which was an adaptation of a book by the same name, just to name a few. It's also wrong for us to go the complete opposite direction of that and to take everything from the world and call it good. This is where things like acceptance of homosexuality as a lifestyle, among other sexual sins that are very prevalent, things like rejection of tradition and creeds, that's where these things find a way to seep into the church and corrupt the truths of God's word. what we see when Jesus was rejected by his own people was that he sent the twelve. He sent more people to deliver grace to them. He continued to give grace and to multiply it. So we also ought to share this grace with others who reject us. It's easy to not want to talk to someone anymore when they say that they have nothing. They don't want anything to do with you or what you're trying to tell them. It's even easier to have one conversation with someone and then say, oh, well, I tried. 
and then leave it at that. I pray that Jesus would change our hearts. That Jesus would change our hearts so that they would act like him in the face of rejection. That he would change our hearts, that we would be able to respond with more grace instead of hostility. Amen.
thanks to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing.
this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in both body and soul, now and unto life everlasting. Live in that peace and depart in that peace. Amen. Let us return thanks. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Receive the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.